a very good evening to you. Thank you for joining us. It is nationwide. I am Ogoch Kuka Ona and we are broadcasting live from Abuja. You can watch this broadcast on all our social media platforms. Now, the nation is in the process of producing 1 million tons of rice within the next three months, following dry season inputs to farmers under the National Agricultural Growth scheme to guarantee food security in the country. Minister of Agriculture and Food Security, Senator Abubakar Khari, stated this at the resumption of the House of Representatives sectoral debates devoted to seeking solutions to challenges in the agricultural sector. Which has rise in the dry season, so but we intend to cultivate about 55,000 hectares, which will impact 110,000 farmers and a yield of 220,000 metric tons. Cassava also is uh, 35,000 hectares with 70,000 farmers and a yield of 525,000 tons. So we're looking at a total of 250,000 hectares of rice for the, set for the dry season, which will mean impacting on 500,000 farmers and which will have an estimated yield of 1 million tons. The minister also emphasized the need for mechanization of the agricultural value chain as a long-term measure for food security. This is something that is a huge setback for us as a country. We are under-tractorized. Today, I'm not too sure if we have 5,000 tractors working. We need over 72,000 with what we have in terms of arable land space. I have identified four critical levers for improving food security, increasing per capita consumption, raising production yield, curbing food price inflation, and reducing reliance on food import. The need for effective cooperation among security personnel and relevant maritime stakeholders was re-emphasized at the Naval War College Nigeria Course 8 Interagency Seminar held in Calabar. Stakeholders believe this will enhance intelligence gathering and information sharing towards sustaining the efforts of the Nigerian Navy to curb criminal activities in the nation's waterways and Gulf of Guinea. Udwak Etim reports. Facing maritime security threats such as crude oil theft, piracy and other criminal activities requires shared responsibility and cooperation of relevant stakeholders. It is in recognition of this that the Naval War College Nigeria Course 8 Interagency Seminar was held in Calabar. Our Director of State Security Service, Cross River State Command, Rosalind Izuagui, who spoke in line with the theme of the seminar, Combating Maritime Crimes, through effective interagency cooperation and collaboration, called for robust synergy among security personnel and stakeholders to fight maritime crimes. So the need for improvement in early warning mechanisms is imperative. We must take a look at the signs when the problem is rearing their heads and tackle it that time together. When you cooperate and collaborate, you are saving costs, you are building confidence, you know, of within all the agencies, so you are creating trust within yourselves. Indeed, the maritime environment is a strategic environment, and uh, it's important that the stakeholders actually work together. It was a good collaboration and cooperation between the relevant maritime stakeholders that something like this should be encouraged every time. Participants and maritime stakeholders embarked on a sea trip to develop the professional ability of command level officers and for effective defense of Nigeria's maritime domain against all forms of threats in Calabar, Uduak Etam, NTN News. In the meantime, a legislation seeking to enhance procedures and strategies for the implementation of international conventions in Nigeria's marine environment has passed second reading at the Senate. Sponsored by Senator Sani Eshinloko, the bill seeks promotion of maritime safety and security as well as providing protection for the country's marine environment. It also seeks to expand the scope of the Nigeria Maritime Administration and Safety Agency to cover several other areas like registration and licensing of ships, accreditation of marine surveyors and enterprise and regulating maritime training institutions. To promote the development of coastal shipping, 
trade and indigenous commercial shipping on national and international waters. Two, to regulate and promote maritime safety and security. Now, the Kirby state government is partnering China to scale up development in major sectors of its economy. Governor Mohammed Idris made this known while hosting the China-Africa Economic Promotion Council in Bern in Kebe. Correspondent Abdul Jalil Bawa has details. The China-Africa Economic Promotion Council is in Kebi State to partner with the state government in the areas of agriculture, infrastructural development, tourism, education and technology, among others. The leader of the delegation, Li Zhangchang, says China described Kebi State as an agricultural hub in the country that attracts partnership for the development of the country. Uh, we hope that uh, our visit in Kebi uh, could help uh, Kebi to uh, develop the infrastructure and boost the economic development. Governor Idris says his administration is ready to partner with foreign investors for the good of the state. I assure you that we are ever ready. We are being blessed with gold, lithium, gypsum. The partnership is expected to kickstart once the arrangements are completed between the state and the team. In Burning Kebi, Abdul Jalil Mohamed Bawa, NTA News. Hope has come alive for Nigerians on the issue of stable power supply as the federal government shows determination through provision and enforcement of existing legal frameworks to empower states to produce and consume electricity. This is receiving commendations and Enugu residents who are elated with these developments are however appealing for full implementation of the liberalization of the power sector. The report. The country's power sector currently generates and supplies between 3,500 megawatts to 4,500 megawatts of electricity to a population of over 200 million people. It is against this backdrop that the federal government, in a resolve to ensure steady electricity supply, adopted the Electricity Act 2023, which provides a holistic integrated policy plan that recognizes all sources for the generation transmission and distribution of electricity. Key players have commended federal government and called for the enabling environment for its implementation. At the sub-national, the 181 megawatts geometric power plant in Aba Adia State is one of the moves to meet the required megawatts. Enugu State Government on its own has unveiled a transition plan from an energy poor state to a commercially viable electricity market, generating over 690 megawatts of electricity and at least 20 hour per day power supply by 2030. In Enugu, Chidi Okrafo, NTA News. Let's now join Chidi Okrafo, who is standing by in Enugu Live to speak more on this development. Now, Chidi, uh, can you hear me? All right, uh, tell us more okay, on the efforts of the government for the steady electricity supply in the state. Okay, thank you, Ogachuku. Um, when the Electricity Act 2023 was uh, adopted by the federal government, Enugu State government immediately swung into action by signing the Electricity Act into law. Okay, just recently, uh, Vice President Kashim Shetima light up uh, uh, flag of the light up Nigeria uh, project. Uh, the project is a southeast uh, initiative. That project is President Bola uh, 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 The project is President Bola uh, uh, project to revamp the nation's economy and ensure rapid uh, industrialization. Uh, back here in Enugu, the state government has keyed into the president into presentable vision because the project is in line with the administration resolve to grow the state economy from 4.4 to 30 billion dollars. 
Okay, thank you very much. It's a very laudable uh, initiative there. But uh, can you tell us more on what the people are saying about this? Okay. Thank you, Agachuku. Uh, the people of Enugu, first and foremost, commended the federal government for liberalizing the power sector. Uh, they, however, appealed to the federal government to sh ensure full implementation of the liberalization. According to them, the liberalization of the uh, power sector will uh, ensure a uh, stable electricity supply across the country. Across the country. Just, rec uh, uh, just recently, the power, uh, geometric power plant was inaugurated in Aba. Aba, as we know, uh, used to witness a uh, epileptic uh, uh, power supply. But today, Aba is now experiencing a 24 hours uh, power, uh, uninterrupted power supply. They are of the view that with the full implementation of the Electricity Act, that uh, every other state in the, uh, the Federation could replicate uh, what is happening in Aba at the moment. Thank you very much, Chidi Okorafo, live from Enugu. Thank you very much for joining us. Okay, now, in keeping with its mandate of ensuring that vulnerable Nigerians are prevented from flood devastation, the National Emergency Management Agency, NEMA, in collaboration with UNOCHA, has commenced a five-day train the trainer workshop on disaster information management. The training drew participants from the intervening agencies for effective 2024 flood mitigation. Iliasu Yakubu reports. Whoa. The 2024 seasonal climate predictions suggested a late onset of rain across the country, especially in the north-central states. Notwithstanding, NEMA is putting in place early mitigation strategies to tackle the unexpected hazards. These trained trainers' workshop represent a significant opportunity for them to enhance their skills and knowledge in managing critical information during the time of disaster. The DG name said participants will be engaged in rigorous training sessions, interactive discussions, and practical exercises designed to enhance expertise in information collection, analysis, and dissemination. The knowledge and skills that will be acquired will not only benefit individual participants, the DG name said, but it will also have a far-reaching impact on the communities, particularly in vulnerable and disaster-prone areas. Timely and accurate information is crucial in mitigating the impacts of disaster, saving lives and ensuring the well-being of affected communities. Head of Coordination, United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, UN Archer, Nigeria, Beatrice Lacorte, expressed the determination of the UN Archer to continue collaboration to involve more strategic intervention and mitigation strategies to reduce the hazards of annual flood devastation. So we thank the DG for giving us this opportunity as OCHA to share our technical expert, expertise in disaster risk management with NEMA. The five-day training is expected to be instrumental to effective mitigation of the 2024 flood devastation. In Abuja, Ilias Yaku, NTA News. And now talking health, cerebrospinal meningitis is one of the communicable diseases associated with hot season and is considered as a major public health challenge with devastating effects when it breaks out, especially in areas with high temperature. Yunusa Suleiman puts together a report on ways to prevent the outbreak of this killer disease with the onset of hot season in some parts of the country. See her again. A season that usually comes with some attendant consequences, such as outbreaks of diseases like cerebrospinal meningitis, a communicable disease that affects human brain and spinal cord membranes, typically caused 
by viral infection, bacteria, and fungi. It is on this basis that health professionals are advocating precautionary measures such as sleeping in ventilated rooms, improving sanitary condition, and practice of good personal hygiene, among others, as ways to prevent the outbreak of meningitis as well as other heat-related diseases in communities with high temperature. We have three classical signs and symptoms like headache, uh, fever, uh, what, uh, another one that we call no chair rigidity. That's the rigidity of the what, neck, where the individual will not be able to touch his chin with the chest like this. Uh, the possible treatment, as I said earlier, is infection. We usually give antibiotic, antimicrobial, depends on the uh, infectious organism that we suspect after we have done tests. In view of some confirmed cases of meningitis in Protescum town and its environs, health experts insist that prevention is far more better than cure. In the matter, Yunusa Suleiman, NTA News. Yunusa, don't go anywhere because we are still staying with you live so that you can educate us more on the situation there in Damaturu. And of course, the highlights on efforts being made to prevent the spread of the disease in Yobe State. It's over to you. Okay, uh, thank you very much and uh, welcome to Damaturu. Well, uh, the reported cases of meningitis in Potoskum Fune and Fika local government areas didn't come as a surprise to the people of the state as uh, usually at the onset of uh, the hot season uh, diseases such as meningitis, measles, uh, cholera have been experienced. Well, over 200 cases reported already with some fatalities. Uh, the state government, upon the report of these uh, cases, the state government uh, sent a powered to that area to commiserate with the affected victims and also to hold a, a, a robust meeting with uh, critical stakeholders there uh, with a view to carry out a series of sensitization, you know, uh, sensitizing the community on how best to prevent themselves. And I must tell you that the state ministry's basic and secondary education has been temporarily relocated to Potoskum to ensure that uh, students, because uh, some of the reported cases uh, emanated from schools around that zone, uh, so as part of strategy for the ministry to sensitize public schools in that area to ensure that uh, no further case is being reported. So these are some of the uh, mechanisms the state government put in place to ensure that uh, the spread of the disease is nip in the board. Well, thank you, Yunusa Suleiman, for that wonderful contribution. And, of course, health is wealth. All right, we'll now be heading straight to Lagos, where Hingino is our guide on reports from that end. Hingino, you're back. It's good to see you again. to see you too, Ogo Chukuka. Nigerians are still mourning the pain of the death of former Chief Executive Officer of Access Bank PLC, late Herbert Wigwe, as they continue to pay glowing tributes to his memory and positive examples. His professional colleagues assembled in Lagos to celebrate his life of impact, Larry Millet reports. The news of the demise of foremost Nigerian businessman, banker, philanthropist, and group managing director of Access Bank PLC, Herbert Wigwe, remains a rude shock to the entire Nigerian government, economy, and financial institution. This is because of his numerous contributions and his innovative banking policies, which have transformed the sector and made visible impacts on the people and the economy of Nigeria. When people like Herbert pass, you don't recover from that person. You just learn to live with the pain. And therein lies the sustainability of his effort, and therein lies the continuation of his legacy. The gathering of these noble Nigerians is therefore to celebrate his life while mourning his death. You are to be part of my success story, 
and I'm proud to name him my devoted friend, mentee and brother. Um, the work he's done, the vision he had, the lives he touched um, will take us a long, long time uh, to replace. How about Onyebumbu Wigwe means many things to different people. We take comfort and so let's in the fact that he lived a great life and that his legacies will be with us forever and ever. His vision is, was incredible. To think about even the, the university that he has more or less brought to life. To the youth of today is to look at the Herbert Wigwe example and his life and see it as something that we can emulate for nation building. We miss him a lot. It's one of those talents that you feel that, you know, Nigeria needs to be able to pull the economy around. It will be recalled that Herbert Wigwe died on February 9, 2024, in a helicopter accident in California, United States of America, alongside his wife, Chizoba, his son, Chizi, and three others. In Lagos, Larry Milei, NT News. May the souls of the departed continue to rest in peace. Adult education has been described as the process of equipping Nigerians with the right systematic learning skills to become vital contributors to national development. Educationists in the field of adult literacy say this informal education system is crucial to economic, political and cultural development of any nation. Larry Bilei again has details. Adult education is a purposive learning in which most adults come to literacy centers to equip themselves with the right skills usually driven by interest and purpose. This is also in tandem with Nigeria's adult education goal, which includes providing functional literacy education for adults who have never had the opportunity of formal education, improving basic knowledge, skills and vocational training for people who need an upgrade. The goal is to move the non-literates to become literates. The more literates we are, the more we understand policies, the more we engage in business transactions successfully, the more we, 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 we don't have conflicts, you know? Because when, when we understand each other, conflict resolution is less because I can understand your point of view because now I am more exposed than I used to be. If we don't take these adult education programs, numerous adult education programs to the grassroots, especially digital literacy that encompasses a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, topics and a lot of concepts that can help bring them into the fold, that can help, that can help them understand how things are evolving in the society and in the world at large, they will be left behind. Educationists believe that the end result should be modifying adults for human capital ventures as vital resources that could lead to national development. In Lagos, Larry Bilei, NT News. Janun, you're welcome to Benin. A seven-man gang allegedly involved in kidnapping, rape, and other offenses at Urumi Axis in Edo Central Senatorial District is now in the custody of Edo State Police Command. Gulakanaini reports that they were paraded at a command by the Commissioner of Police. The report. The suspects who are within the age bracket of 15 and 24 are said to be among the suspects unleashing mayhem in Urumi and environs. They were also alleged to have been responsible for gang raping of one of their female victims to death. But who were arrested at different locations within the metropolis were in possession of cash, different ID cards, carrying Nigerian nationality, and other assorted items allegedly used to facilitate their nefarious activities. CP Adiboye says there is no hiding place for criminals in Edu and has urged citizens to be vigilant. When we see something, when we see some unusual movement, some people will come around 8 o'clock p.m., they go, 9 p.m., they go to Suya, they want to buy Suya of 10,000, 20,000. I expect such Suya people to report their movement, people like this. They will go and buy a packet of cigarettes, Indomie, Indomie packet, 
10,000, 20,000. These are things they want to go and use to keep their victims to be safe because actually in most cases they don't want them dead. It is their money that they want. The group who are suspected to be citizens of one of the neighboring countries bordering Nigeria could not express themselves in English. They will appear in court when investigations are concluded. In Benin, good luck in any interviews. About 200 youths have commenced training for onward empowerment on the necessary skills and knowledge to become proficient in Adire craftsmanship in Ikiti. This is a sequel to the unveiling of Adire Ikiti Home by Ikiti State Governor Biodun Oyibanji to boost youth empowerment. Adobe Jujuba reports. It is an initiative designed under the PET project Widows and Orphans Hope scheme of the wife of Ikiti State Governor, Dr. Olayemi Oyebanji, which focuses on addressing unemployment challenges. The venture is to serve as a platform for youth development, fostering entrepreneurship, and preserving Ikiti's rich cultural heritage. My aim is to give them, is to empower them to be able to fish. So if they key into the vision, I expect them to be able to fend for, them, for themselves at the end of the day. Governor Oyebanji, while inaugurating the center, said the Adire Ikiti Hub initiative will serve as positive manifestation of shared prosperity vision, offering not only an avenue for economic empowerment, but also opportunities for cultural enrichment and tourism promotion. We are not going to train you and just allow you to go like that. We will follow you through at every step. Adira is a very lucrative business if they put their mind to it. So it's all about mindset. It's not about what they can benefit now, but it's looking, you know, what they can gain in the future. Participants will receive training from skilled artisans learning traditional techniques alongside modern practices to ensure their competitiveness in present day's market. In Adoikiti, Adobeji Ojegba, NTA News. Those are our stories from here. Nationwide, we'll continue in Abuja with Ogo Chukuka. Thank you very much, Anguli. And in line with your last reports, any nation that intends to guarantee its future must invest in mentorship and impartation of valuable skills on the youths, as this will enhance their employability and productivity towards socioeconomic development. This is the standpoint of Governor Basi Otu of Cross River State, while playing host to the Minister of State for Youth Development, Ayodele Olawande, who is on a working visit to the state. Justina Etim reports. The Sinobo administration through the One Youth, Two Skills initiative, targeted at ensuring that both the educated and uneducated youths have access to comprehensive skills that will promote their employability and self-reliance. It's e-learning. It's life class. After doing this, we expose you to digital community, whereby you meet people, you, meet, you can work in your house and earn money. And we turn it to research hub. Governor Tu says efforts are being made to restructure some universities to expose students to entrepreneurship education that will improve their employability status. Today, uh, we have too many people who cannot wait again for tomorrow. As somebody starts work today, he wants to drive a jeep tomorrow, tomorrow. If he doesn't drive a jeep, there has to be a problem there and so on and so forth. Any society that is like that, there's a problem in that society. I understand quite well all fingers are not the same, but then there has to be gradual progress. If not so, even the joy cannot be sustained. The minister also assures that the present administration is working assiduously to fix the economy. In Calabar, Justina Etam, NTA News. A large number of enthusiastic parents in Meduguri, the Bono State Capital, have embraced the subnational immunization plus days of polio campaign flagged off across the 27 local government areas of the state. Tina Toro has details. The exercise, according to the organizers, is a critical vaccination initiative with emphasis on safeguarding children from diseases such as measles and polio through routine immunization. 
The executive director of the State Primary Health Care Development Agency, Professor Arab Al Haji, represented by Deputy Director Mala Abdul Wahab, enjoined the people of the state to actively participate in preventing polio by ensuring their eligible children receive the essential vaccines. What we are doing here is for the people to understand the polio vaccination, even though we've eradicated the, the blue PV that usually causes the paralysis. But we have to sustain the eradication by way of making sure every quarter we have the polio outbreak response. Sheho of Borno, who was represented by district head of Dombua, Zanala Walmeina, echoed this conviction, assuring parents that the vaccine poses no harm to their children's health. United messages from partners emphasize the crucial role of vaccines and appeal to parents and caregivers to collaborate with the dedicated teams conducting door-to-door -door visits for eligible children. We want to ensure that uh, every child, every child is not left behind. So for UNICEF, we are co collaborating with the state government as well as all partners to ensure that children 0 to 5 years are get vaccinated with this polio vaccine. This comprehensive polio vaccination campaign has garnered support from key partners in Meduguri, Tina Toro, NTA News. We're talking health matters in an effort to curtail further transmission of Lassa fever in Nigeria. The federal government has flagged off rats disinfection exercise following recent outbreak of the disease at the 44 Army Reference Hospital in Kaduna State. Charles Alpha reports. On the 21st of February this year, 44 Army Reference Hospital in Kaduna State reported an outbreak of Lassa fever. We have uh, had 15 confirmed cases of Lassa fever so far, mm -hmm. with uh, seven deaths. We have the last result this morning, and also we have lost the patient also out of the 15. You can see the, the, the fatality rate is very high. Minister of Environment Balarabi Abbas Lawal represented by the Registrar Environmental Health Council of Nigeria, Yakubu Mohamed Baba, in line with the Ministry's mandate of keeping the environment safe, flagged off set of measures in Kaduna State to curtail further spread of the already identified eight endemic local government areas to other parts of the country. The Ministry aim is to support the state of Kaduna in cutting the transmission of Lassa fever by targeting the vector responsible for its spread. I do understand that there is now a new technology in town with respect to the baits for the rats. Immediately we heard about this program and we felt it necessary for management to be represented here so that we know what we need to do as a management of our institution. Some of the measures include the deratization of both federal and state institutions, including private and public facilities in the state, building of capacity of health personnel, issuance of deratization certificate, the facilities already certified, and work with ministry departments and agencies to restore cleanliness and safety in the state. Charles Alpha, NT News. We'll now be joining Salamatu Lukman who is standing by in Kaduna Network Center for more reports from that zone. Thank you for joining us here, Ogo Chukuka, and you're welcome to Kaduna. The Kaduna State Government has initiated a comprehensive plan to ensure internally displaced families in southern Kaduna return to their villages. The State Deputy Governor Hadiz Abalarabi disclosed this development during the inauguration of a committee for the resettlement of the IDPs at the Government House. Mohamed Marajingi reports. Since their displacement from their ancestral roots, the internally displaced families desire to return to the villages they once called home. The inauguration of this committee, however, for the resettlement of the families, is now bringing a sense of hope to the victims that soon their dream will come true. The committee, comprising of representatives from various sectors, has been tasked with the responsibility of coming up with assessment of the needs and concern of the displaced families to begin a new life. We have the goal to empower them, restore their dignity, and enable them to once again become active members of their communities. It is imperative that we all understand that the process of resettlement is complex and multifaceted. 
It requires coordinated efforts from various stakeholders, including us as government, humanitarian organizations, and the local communities. As a committee to begin implementing the resettlement plans, there was a sense of hope among the internally displaced persons that their sufferings will soon be over. In Kaduna, I am Muhammad Umarajingi, NTA News. From the IDP's resettlement, healthcare services of the Nigerian Defense Academy has received a boost with the inauguration for Jews of the Viki Irabo Maternity Center at the NDA Hospital in Ribado Cantonment, Kaduna. Dauda Muhammad reports that the center is part of Defense Officers' Wives Association's DEPOA's contribution towards addressing maternal child mortality. The hot weather could not dampen the enthusiasm shown by guests, including wives of military and medical personnel, who came to witness the inauguration of the maternity center named after originator of the project. The six-bed maternity center, consisting of operating theater, consulting rooms, and delivery suits, all equipped with state-of-the-art facilities, was built by former president, defense and police officers' wives association, wife of former chief of defense staff, Vicky Irabo, and equipped as well as furnished by the present president, Defense and Police Officers' Wives Association, wife of the present chief of defense staff, Ogogo Musa. Deputy Commonwealth should take a clue from that to continue the project here, yeah, presentation has started, and it will really help us. So we don't have abandoned projects all over the place. We continue to execute projects as God enables us. We continue to assist our husbands filling the gaps. That is what we are good at doing as their wives. The initiative has clearly provided a critically needed service that will enhance the health care of soldiers and their families and generations are yet unborn. Named Vicky Irabo Maternity Center, the facility is expected to serve the health care needs of women in the barracks community, police officers' wives, as well as the civilian population, and thank them with the present vision of improving military civilian relationship. In Kaduna, Dauda Mohammed, NTA News. And that completes our package from here, Ibadan Network Center. <laughs>2nd Indigenous Inspector General of Police, the project Kayode Adeolu Egbetokun Wards and Physiotherapy Department is centered on the well-being of the officers and men of the force. Applauding ACP Kazim Olakunle of the Oyo State's Command Medical Unit for initiating the project, the IGP urged the leadership in the various police commands, especially the medical sector, to always look in what and think of projects that would be of benefit not only to the police, but the general public. This hospital, no doubt, is going to serve members of the police force in Oyo State Command, and even officers visiting Oyo State and members of the community in Oyo State. I want to say a big thank you to everyone who supported the Assistant Commissioner of Police in ensuring that um, this project is completed in record time. Made up of seven wards and a physiotherapy unit, the clinic would cater for the medical needs of officers and men of the force, as well as others within the police community. In Ibado, Grace Ionliki, NTA News. Discharging inflammable petrol from tankers into underground tanks is a delicate task that requires adequate safety procedures at filling stations. At least four petrol stations in Ilori have been gutted by fire in the last one month due to negligence. Abdul Wahid Bibire here takes a look 
at the level of compliance with safety rules among filling stations in Ilori while discharging fuel into underground tanks. There are over 750 major and independent petrol marketers scattered across the 16 local government areas of Kwara State. In the last two months, four of these filling stations were gutted by fire in the course of taking delivery. The incidents will have wreaked devastating havoc if not for the swift intervention of firemen. The Midstream and Downstream Petroleum Authority, who is the regulatory body in Nigeria, attributes the major cause of fire outbreak in filling stations to failure to adhere to standard safety procedures, which include non-availability of acting system and unqualified personnel. The underground tank must have been opened maybe an hour prior to the arrival of the truck. The state fire service has always highlighted the safety apparatus expected to be at a filling station in case of a fire disaster. The perimeter fence must be up to six to seven feet just to prevent any hazard that may be come to their to their location. A stitch in time saves nine ends implementing standard operating procedures at filling station we no doubt assist in curbing cases of fire especially during dry season. Abdul Wahid Bibire NTA News those are the trending reports from Ibadan. This hour nationwide continues with Ogachukuka in Abuja studios. Thank you, Larry, and welcome back to Abuja. The chairman, board of trustees of the Nigeria Muslim Forum United Kingdom, Dr. Abdallah Shehu, has called on Nigerians to uphold unity and tolerance to foster national development. He made his call at the recently concluded annual general meeting of the association in Derby, United Kingdom. Correspondent Olawale Hamzat reports. The Nigeria Muslim Forum UK recently held its annual general meeting in Derby, United Kingdom. The gathering provided a platform for members and executives of the association to review activities within the year and discuss issues of common interest as it concerned the welfare of its members. The chairman, board of trustees of the forum, Dr. Abdallah Shou, admonished the Muslim Ummah to continue to play their role in Nigeria's development. We may have different views, different upbringings, different experiences in life, but we should have one common object objective, respect one another, love one another, and do things to the community, not just for your benefit, but for everybody else. Truly, mashallah, the Nigerian community is beginning a community in the UK, and they are active, I see them, and they are trying really to to have maybe more role in the society at large, which is very good. It's for us to reflect and appreciate our diversity and also ensure inclusivity in all activities that we do when it comes to serving humanity. The level of professionalism and the contribution we've made uh, to this uh, great country. So, we, and the same is in, with North America. Uh, we have the highest number of professionals. We are recognized as the most educated uh, people, uh, immigrants in, in, in America, in, in Canada. A words of recognition were given to some guests and members who have distinguished themselves in their chosen endeavor. Olawali Hamzat, NTA. The federal government has reiterated its commitment to implementing the United Nations Mine Action Service in the northeast region of the country. The Minister of State for Defense, Bello Mohammed, gave the assurance while receiving a delegation from the United Nations Mine Action Service led by the director, Elaine Cohen, at the ship house. The minister stressed government's readiness to collaborate with OMAS to facilitate the reintegration of internally displaced persons into the society to improve improve their livelihoods. The leader of the delegation commended the minister's efforts in mobilizing the Borno state government to key into the initiative and affirmed the services commitment to support the ongoing rehabilitation of IDPs in the region. And next is sports updates with Gift George. <laughs> 